in a previous video, I took apart this electrically heated shower head and it didn't really comply with what you might call uh, British or European safety regulations. It's got an earth wire going across the front of the water flow and uh, it's got a bare heating element inside. The water flow is cross heating element, pushes this diaphragm up, which then uh, pushes the contacts together at the back. And the main thing about this, uh, and then it flows out the, the front, but the main thing about this is that uh, if you put your hand up to this front of it, you can get a tingle. It depends on how good your sort of grounding is and... Uh, People have been electrocuted with these things trying to change the heating elements in them because the heating elements are prone to failing and if they forget to turn the power off or it's miswired, that's when they bite it. However, for fairness, uh, we do have electric, electrically heated showers in the UK and, you know, it's a really common thing. And you've basically got this unit mounts in the wall inside the shower with a mains feed going into it, 240 volts uh, and a cold water supply. And you've got the hose coming out the bottom to the shower head with the sort of rubber pips in the front. That The reason that these jets are rubber is because uh, if you rub them, it means that any buildup of uh, the um, calcium and stuff like that on them will uh, crack off and it, it sort of cleans them. So let's take a look inside this unit. Let's take it to bits completely, in fact, because that's why I got this particular unit. It's a second-hand unit purely because I really want to com you know, completely destroy it. So inside it, oh, uh, first of all, operation. Uh, to use the shower, you start by turning it on by selecting high, well, they call it economy down here. But most people would call it low or cold or off. Uh, in the cold position, it just sprays out cold water. Economy, That this is useful in summer if the water that's coming into the house is already warm uh, and the water pressure would be otherwise quite high to get it down to the correct temperature. But high is the most common uh, setting. And, uh, these things are rated typically about 7 kilowatts up to about, I think some of them go up to 11 or 12 kilowatts, I think. But usually it's in the range of 8 to 10 kilowatts. To vary the temperature in a more detailed way, you just vary the flow rate. So if the water's too hot, you uh, turn it in the direction of the colder arrow and it basically increases the water flow through the heating element. There's no fancy electronic control of the, the heat because uh, it would be quite complex. So really, you just uh, vary the temperature by varying the flow. And likewise, in winter, when it's really the water's ice cold and it's coming into the house, you to get the water hot enough, you'd probably have to turn it to the hotter setting, which would reduce the flow to, well, in some instances, near enough a trickle. Uh, so let's take the cover off. It doesn't come off this easy normally. I've uh, taken the screws out. And let's take a look. Uh, you may notice the video quality... Well, let's actually brighten that up. The video quality is different. Uh, the sound quality is completely uh, different. Uh, let me know what you think. It's a different uh, device I'm using for filming. So inside, we've got the switch that controls the... Uh, turning the on and setting the temperatures. We've got the flow valve down here. We've got a solenoid valve on the water inlet uh, that as soon as you turn this to any position other than off, this solenoid valve will be activated. Very common uh, to fail with these solenoid valves. Very easy to change in most showers. After that, we've got the flow regulator. We've got a pressure diaphragm here that if the water pressure is too low, it will uh, interact with these switches in some way, the, the power setting switches, and it will turn the shower uh, off. Um, the mains comes in, and the design of this particular shower is designed to accommodate water coming in at various positions and being diverted. There's room inside to divert it across to where the water goes in. And also it can accommodate cables coming in from the top or bottom in various positions. It's designed to be uh, used to replace existing showers that might have an uh, existing wiring arrangement. So you've got our earth connection, and this is quite important. The earth connection goes up, and the first thing it does, well, the only thing it really does, is go onto the metal structure that bonds the heating elements to ground. Uh, hopefully the heating elements in this will be sleeved, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, and that is the main safety feature that... Uh, in the event of the heating elements failing, current leaking to uh, in potentially the water, then it's going to cause the earthly good circuit breaker to trip. Or if it's not got an earthly good circuit breaker, theoretically, it's going to keep the water at ground voltage level until the current reaches a level that it's going to cause uh, the, the circuit breaker or fuse to trip. We've got the live and neutral coming in. I noticed a neutral wire sneaking across from here under and it's going straight to the solenoid. So the solenoid has its neutral all the time. 
The neutral then goes up to the one end of the heating elements, and the two heating elements here are common together. That then goes along to the neutral, uh, to the neutral connection of the uh, neon indicator here. Um, the live comes up and it goes on to one end of a thermal cutout. The thermal trip here is, it's a safety feature that if the temperature goes too high in here, uh, then it will cut out and stop the unit, uh, basically boiling the water or, or having other problems. Uh, that terminal also has two connections looping out. One goes to the switch that powers the solenoid, and the other one goes to the NEAN indicator. So ultimately, as long as this unit's powered, the NEAN indicator is lit. I've uh, just realised the water's still dripping out of this thing. That's okay. When you've, you've used these units, water kind of gets trapped in here because of the way it works. As we'll see when we take it apart. And ultimately, I think that's more or less it. So let's start taking it to bits. We'll start by taking off the solenoid controlled water inlet. Let's jiggle these connections off. That's quite stiff. We have to use a pair of pliers to get that off. Nope, there it's off. So I'll take these screws out here. As I say, the solenoid uh, valves are prone to failing in these. And when they fail, it's a very, very easy fix. So everything in these, uh, there's now water pouring everywhere. Right, okay, one moment, please. Yeah, that's messy. Uh, yeah, quite a lot of water in that. Yeah, that's uh, I'm forgetting that because the solenoid valve is now uh, removed, it's the bit that's been stopping the water getting out that hole. So, um, right, that should be it more or less mopped up, I think. Let's give it another go and see if any, you know, there's more. There's, there's tons of water in this. This is going to be very, very messy. Yeah. Let's see if we can get it all out. Right, I think that's most of it, but I'm sure lots more will dribble out as we as we progress here. Yeah, right. The solenoid valve mechanism, everything goes together with these O-rings. I'll just shake that water out. If you need to change the solenoid valve, it's usually this bit that fails here, the solenoid, the winding itself. And the way to get that off is to put a suitably sized screwdriver underneath it and just gently prise it up. Uh, either two scratch screwdrivers at once because you can snap the little plastic pin these go onto, or just gently nudge either side. See if that's going to come off. It is just friction fit. And that's it. So you can buy these quite cheaply online and uh, all they do is they press onto this and then uh, these little indents the little indent here will go into one of these notches, just depending on which way you uh, want the connections to point. So that's a very simple uh, fix. What's next? The next thing is this pressure switch arrangement. Let's uh, get this out. I notice this little plastic plate here is designed that if water gets into this and drips down from above, it will prevent it or deflect it from actually going onto the coil. It's also worth mentioning that this thing has a rubber seal. If you look at, if I tilt this up, you'll see that this is sort of black o-ring type material here, but it only basically forms an arch over the top so that if any water, if you put a shampoo bottle above this or something or spray water on it, it's going to cast the water to the side. Uh, it's going to limit the possibility of water going through, but if water does get in, it should hopefully just uh, pour through the unit without causing any issues. It's unlikely. It's got that seal at the top, so any water splash from the sides will be deflected by these lips. Let's uh, get this off. So a couple of screws here. So this is a flow regulator, but it's also the safety uh, switch if the flow, uh, if the water gets turned off for any reason, like the solenoid valve uh, feeling. This may not come out easily unless I lift the heater block up as well. So let's uh, take some more screws out. I'll try and stay in shot, but uh, this new filming device has a slightly different position for uh, its filming. 
it covers a different sort of uh, field of view, so to speak. This is sealed, but that's okay. I have a Dremel. Okay, this is the bit that's got all the water in it. So uh, that's off. Is this going to come off? Nope, there's another screw. That would explain why it wasn't coming off so easily. So this is the flow regulator. Let's open this up. Just get all the screws out. Take the thing completely to bits. I will also take the uh, diaphragm bit off as well. Uh, there's more water coming out. This is not particularly surprising given that it is basically a shower that's uh, designed to, well, have lots of water. I should get more paper towel. I really should get more paper towel because this is otherwise going to leave even more staining on the bench. So this is the uh, flow regulation knob. Okay. So that couples on to... All right, so how does this regulate the flow? It's not immediately obvious. Oh, right, okay. Is that just pulling the spline back? I think it's the spline bit that by pulling it in and out, it regulates the amount of liquid that can flow past that. Yeah. The water seems to be coming from the back here, and this has tapered this sort of spline section. So um, I'm guessing that as you adjust this, and it pulls it backwards and forwards with this thread in here, oh yes, it's quite significant movement, look at that. It is. It's basically pulling this splined plug backwards and forwards to regulate the flow of water through. Then there's also the void at the back that is deflecting the water up to this bit, the plunger here which uh, is basically, it looks like it's just a rubber plunger that pushes up when there's pre pressure there. So, let's get this off. This is coincidentally the uh, same shower as they have at the local gym, so I use this uh, regularly during the week. They've got a few uh, cubicles with these in it. Okay. So, yeah, it's a spring-loaded uh, plunger pressing against this diaphragm, which uh, I should be able to hike out. Suitable screwdriver for hiking. Ew. Yeah, so... Uh, that's fundamentally it. Just a little sort of bleed hole coming through from the main water inlet so that as the pressure build, uh, builds up and the water's on and you've got that slight flow restriction uh, from the shower head spray nozzles, that will push this diaphragm out, which will push this plunger up. But what does that do? I'm going to have to get the paper towel. One moment, please. Let's mop this up before uh, I end up with uh, an excessive amount of uh, water on the bench. It is MDF, so at some point it will probably just puff up. Next bit is the uh, bit that selects the electric, the heat settings, which uh, all it's doing is selecting between these two terminals here, which it's either going to be one on its own, Let's get these off, in fact. Have I got a bigger screwdriver? I should have a bigger screwdriver. So let's pop those lugs off. Noting that the one at the front of these two switches actually goes to the back terminal, and the one at the back goes to the front terminal. 
I don't know if the heating elements are rated the same. I suppose you know I could measure the resistance right now, couldn't I? That would yeah, give an indication. Although I'm expecting it to be quite a low value uh, of resistance. Each one will be rated probably in the region, in this case, about 4 kilowatts. Uh, so the resistance of the uh, test leads alone will be a significant factor in the sort of reading I'm going to get. So let's go from the common here onto one heating element, which is showing about 12 ohms. And likewise, the back one, slightly higher, 15 ohms. So I'm guessing the front one is the main heating element. And the back one is the auxiliary one for uh, just adding that extra heat in the sort of summertime. In the wintertime, should I say. Okay, and there's the thermal cutout. We'll get that off as well just to give us maximum access for removing stuff here. At some point, I'm going to have to remove all the connections anyway when I dremel this, but I'll pause probably while I dremel this open because it's going to take a wee while, it's going to be quite noisy. I don't think there's any way to open this other than dremeling because it looks as though it's been crimped round onto that. I'm conscientiously putting the screws back in. This is pointless if I'm about to destroy the thing completely. Okay, so let's pull this little neon indicator off here and take a look at the switch assembly. Here is the switch assembly. You've got the one switch just on plastic pins at the back that is the one that controls the solenoid valve. And it just appears to be pressing against, by the look of it, this uh, flat on the cam. So whatever way you rotate it, uh, as soon as it's in a different position, it's pushing that switch in to activate the solenoid. The mechanism of the switches how is that interlocked with the... Okay... Right, how is this uh, going? Right, I think we're going to have to open this up further. It's not overly obvious. This is where it all falls to bits and then it was never... We can never work out what how it worked. Oh, I get it, I get it. When the plunger pushes up, it's the bit that pushes those switches in. But depending on the position of the cam, it then bypasses that by pushing them out to stop them actually going in. That's very simple. The other thing they could have done theoretically is put one switch to... Uh, break the power to both of them. But ultimately, because of what they're doing here, th these switches only be, need to be rated for half the load of the whole shower. So they're only switching for, well, they'll be standard 16 amp switches. That makes sense. Oh, that that is logical. Because otherwise it'd have to be a very high power switch. That's quite clever. I wasn't expecting it to be the actual, the diaphragm is the bit that actually pushes the switches in. And uh, the cam simply prevents uh, the switch is being pushed in if there, if that power setting is not uh, needed. Okay. And that just leaves the heater. So, let's get the earth connection off. Oh, let's... Uh, is that going to come off? Yes, it is. Uh, and the neutral connection. Oh, there's another bit. There's another bit that I should look at. So here's the heater block. It's plastic. Uh, earlier ones used to be all metal, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. You know what? I'm going to empty this before I make a huge mess. I've already made a huge mess, but that's okay. No great surprise. This thing has lots of water in it. Ah. Uh, sound of squishy rags being thrown on the floor, which isn't actually a very good thing to do, really.
Yes, as I was saying, uh, the before I open this up, put my finger over that, uh, notice that everything is just O-rings, so there's an O-ring in that. This is a, another safety feature. All right, okay, take this out. If you block the water outlet, there's this little pressure release valve. And what happens is that uh, suddenly, this will, uh, if the pressure builds up too high, it will blow, it will plug out of this. And if that happens, a stream of water will just start spraying out uh, the bottom of your shower unit without actually coming through the hose. Some water will still come through the hose, but it will just be a jet of water spraying out the bottom here. It's an easy fix. You can buy these online very cheaply and easily from eBay. It comes out with its little o-ring, and all it is, it's a little tube with a bend in it, and it's got a little plug in it in there, this little rubber plug. And all that happens is that plug blows out. Theoretically, then, that plug will blow clear. Um, I can't, that doesn't fit in. But it will sort of blow clear and it will come out the hose and go down your drain. If it didn't, then I wonder if you could actually have just fed it back in from this side. I'm guessing that the way they load that is they put a little insert in here to stop going in too far and then push the plug in. And it is just a, a, pre, a friction thing that's going to blow that out. But you can get these complete assemblies there, and it is just literally, to change it, uh, you put the little o-ring in here, um, and then place this in so it snugs into that o-ring, and then tighten these screws up. That's a very, very easy fix. Right, now I'm going to pause and I'm going to Dremel open. I'm going to empty this for a start, there's water everywhere. Uh, and I'm going to Dremel into this and we'll see what's inside. Oh, special thanks to Kyle, who uh, sent me a pack of these Dremel uh, cutters. They're very good. It's a system whereby you uh, pull a little spring-loaded catch down, rotate the blade half a turn, and it just pops straight off. It's quite easy to change them. And likewise, when you put it back on, you just pull the little plunger down, rotate it, and then it snaps into position and locks it in. Very good. I shall take that out before I end up dropping this and uh, damaging the blade. The deed is done. The unit is open. It's different to what I was expecting. I suppose, ultimately, it's quite a long element. Um, now, which of these was it? The front one was the hottest, was it? Hold on a second. I'm just going to... little reminder here. So the front one, I'm pretty sure this was the 12 ohm one. Yes, it is. So the highest power element is the shorter one here that uh, as the water comes in, it will fill up the chamber. It will come in this sort of area here. And because there's a copper pipe up the middle of this, and that's fundamentally all there is in here, quite thick plastic. Uh, the water flows in and around this element and then before it can get out it has to go right up to the top and down that pipe uh, which is right up close to the top here and that pipe is also um, directly under the surface that the temperature, the thermal overload cutout is in when both units, uh, so in, I'm guessing that in a Summertime, when you're only using one section, it'll be this sort of higher temperature section. And in the wintertime, when you're using both sections, it'll be both of these. It's quite an interesting arrangement. It's not what I was expecting, but ultimately, I suppose it makes sense because it uh, gets the largest area of uh, the uh, exposed element for the water to flow around. Yeah. So, other things that come to mind. Oh, yes, another thing worth mentioning about the thermal cutout. When the thermal cutout trips, um, when you've used this shower, if you go into one of these showers directly after someone else has been in using it, then initially when you turn it on, even though you turn it to the hot water setting, there's a good chance that the water will come through cold. The reason for that is because it contains uh, this thermal cutout. And when you turn the water off, although uh, the water flow stops almost immediately, there's enough, enough thermal inertia, there's enough thermal mass, should I say, in these heat elements that it will raise the temperature of the water to the point you'll often hear quite a loud click of this uh, cutout going out. And uh, the answer to that is just turn it on, but, well, don't stand under the cold water ultimately, uh, and just leave it for a while. And after it's cooled down enough, then it'll, you'll hear the click and it'll cut in. That thermal cutout is also useful where... Uh, 
the water pressure really drops while you're having a shower and the temperature you know, starts going too high um, and it will then cut the power to the elements. So yeah, it's quite well designed, it's quite well built, it's certainly evolved over time. Um, it looks pretty good. Uh, and the fact that uh, all the electrical side of it is really, uh, in this case, it's the, this is fully met grounded metalwork and the elements are all bonded. It means that if the element physically fails, then it's going to cause, you know, it's going to ground it. It's not going to pose an electric shock risk. So there we have it. The typical British and I suppose ultimately European electric showers. The main requirements uh, are to have a high voltage in the region of like 220 to 240 volts to be able to use these things and also a high current availability, which we do have in the UK. Um, with lower voltages, it, you would require really astronomical current to actually power these things. Uh, typically, these are uh, powered from a 40, 45 amp sort of circuit breaker. Um, but yeah, interesting stuff.